Um, so uh, this is a vast topic <laughs> and one that has been ignored for a very long time. Um, so it's not a thing that I could fully do justice to in any way in a, in a, in a brief interview as this. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of key, you know, themes that I think, you know, provide lessons like, uh, you know, trying to provide maximum benefit in a short amount of time. So I'll reduce it to three kind of key um, lessons that we can draw from the West African Islamic tradition. Um, keeping in mind first and foremost that the West African Islamic tradition is the origin of the American Muslim community. Because enslaved Africans were brought to this country before this country was this country. Before there's a United States of America, there are Muslims that are praying on plantations in South Carolina, and there are Muslims that are praying in Virginia, and there are Muslims that are praying um, in, in, in New York City there before, you know, when it's, uh, when it's under Dutch control. So Islam gets implanted here in what eventually becomes the United States of America um, before, you know, <laughs> the Declaration of Independence and all that. So this is really about a, an investigation of not what we can learn from a different tradition, but what we can learn by looking back to the origins of our own tradition. <laughs> okay, that's the, that's the first thing. Um, so then what are the kind of three principal lessons that we can draw from that? Um, and I'll reduce it to, to, to just three words in order um, to keep things simple. Peace, knowledge, and benefit, okay? Now what do I mean by, by those? There's a, and I'll, I'll give a short definition and then I'll expand with some historical examples. So peace, um, giving reference to two things primarily. First, that the Islamic tradition in West Africa spreads almost exclusively through nonviolent means, okay? Um, so West African countries that are today 95, 98, 99 percent Muslim were never subject to the Arab conquest that led to the establishment of Islam in other parts of the Muslim world. Muslims in sub-Saharan West Africa adopted Islam voluntarily and there's a, there's a, a lot of um, wisdom that can be drawn from how they were able to successfully spread Islam peacefully because that's if we're going to spread Islam in this country that's how we we're going to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, the second part of the, the piece is that the, the focus on peace was a broader uh, was part of a broader focus on um, downplaying explicitly political and worldly aspirations amongst learned scholars. Leave the world to the worldly. <laughs> focus on spiritual and social development amongst the children of Adam and you will build a sound society from the bottom up by forming one solid human brick at a time. Rather than trying to, 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 to capture power from the top down, build society from the bottom up. So peace, and I'll come back to historical examples. Knowledge, um, focus, a focus on a deep commitment to learning and scholarship, okay? Um, in other words, Islam not as being um, just, a, Islam not as being about identity, you know, I'm a Muslim. You know, no, what, what, what does that mean? It means, you know, learning, pursuing knowledge of God, pursuing knowledge of his messenger. That's the, that's the, the, the model. Um, so not focused on, uh, you know, identity, um, not even focused in a narrow way on piety. Piety is, of course, important, but the people of uh, guidance in this religion have been referred to in the Quran as the ulama, the, the knowledgeable. <laughs> so being pious isn't enough. <laughs> you, you know, you've got to pursue knowledge. And that has particular lessons for, um, for our communities, particularly, I think, in the African-American Muslim community. You know, as, as, a, as, a, as a kid, small child growing up in D.C. in the late, you know, 1970s, early 1980s, if you had your face in a book, somebody would, you know, accuse you of acting white. <laughs> and, you know, we need to be reminded that there were jet black West African scholars reading and writing books in the Arabic language, reading and writing books in African languages using the Arabic script a thousand years ago. And they built their communities and centered their social lives around the pursuit of knowledge. So that that is in no way um, 
a value or a set of practices that's alien to our community. Um, finally, benefit. And then these are, these are just the glosses. We'll give it some examples. Benefit, that, that the main part of how that peaceful spread of Islam took place was that there was less of a focus on overt proselytizing, attempting to convince people of the truth of your religion then there was a, an attempt to focus on providing benefit to the children of Adam, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a hadith where the, the Prophet says that the hearts, of the, uh, the hearts of the children of Adam naturally incline to those who provide benefit for them. If you want to, to, to have Islam um, impact this society, either through conversion or just through informing the ethical values of the society itself, <laughs> um, you know, through Islamic examples, and both things are good <laughs> from a Muslim standpoint, um, then the, the best way to do that is to focus on providing benefit to people rather than trying to convince them that you're right and they're wrong. Okay, now, practical historical examples. <laughs> the, the military conquest, peace first, the military conquest um, didn't reach sub-Saharan Africa for a number of reasons. First and foremost, when the Muslims tried to come down the Nile, they were defeated by a Nubian army um, in 652 CE um, that had uh, an, a, a core of archers that were described in contemporary Muslim sources as capable of putting an arrow in your eye from 300 paces away. You know, so if you see, you know, Steph Curry you know, drain and jump shots, you know, uh, know that manual dexterity, you know, didn't start when, <laughs> when, when Africans came here. Um, so th this led to, you know, military prowess in an African context, and the, the, the Muslims were unable to invade Sub-Saharan Africa. They were stopped. Um, so then a different course of action and different set of relationships emerged because of that. Merchants then spread Islam first, but you know merchants are there on business. They're not there to teach people religion, but they open the first trade routes that then allow scholars to come behind. But not even that many scholars initially make that move. What's decisive, especially in West Africa, is that after a, the, a few, the first Muslims come um, and uh, um, a few scholars follow them, you know, down uh, trans-Saharan trade tra uh, trading trails some indigenous West Africans themselves not only convert to Islam, but take it uh, as their vocation to teach the Quran <laughs> and to spread Islam and Islamic knowledge specifically within their own societies. So it's the emergence of an indigenous West African clerical class, a class that focuses on religious knowledge um, that, that ends up um, transmitting Islam in all the different directions throughout West Africa. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, in the very earliest days, um, the, the, the earliest traditions that you can document are two towns that are now in the, um, the modern Republic of Mali. They were at the time uh, within the bounds of the Empire of Ghana, um, which was the, 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 the Right there with China, the wealthiest and most powerful kind of political unit in the world at the time. Um, but the two towns were called Kabara and Jaga. Um, so Kabara was a, a place that produced a bunch of really erudite scholars, you know, from the period of about uh, 900 or 1000 CE until the 15 or 1600s, and not so many since. Um, but Jaga, which is the, the point of origin for um, probably the oldest living tradition of scholarship today in West Africa, the Jahanke tradition, the name comes from Jaga, that was a, a teaching tradition that was established in the same period and is still alive today, more than a thousand years old. And there's Jahanke clerical families with names like uh, Drame, Jane, Sise, Tore, um, and others in almost every West African country right down to the present. Um, and they, uh, in turn, um, you know, members of other West African ethnic groups imitated their model and began specializing in Islamic knowledge within their own communities because they learned Quran from, from these people and replicated the model in their own society, so Islam spread in these ways. So this, this happens, you know, in, in Senegal, it happens in um, 
really all over, you know, the, the all over West Africa. Um, and this, you know, ends up being the, the thing that, that really starts to implant Islam in West African society as early as a thousand years ago. You know, the way that I, I often like to say this is that, um, so the, the Quran was taught on these wooden boards, which was actually one of the first mediums that was used to write the Quran in the early days of Islam. And it was, it's still used in West Africa today, even though it's almost been abandoned everywhere else in the Muslim world. Um, so it was the jihad of the wooden board, not the jihad of the sword, that, that spread Islam in, in West Africa. So the jihad of teaching people literacy skills and the Quranic text um, that, that did a lot of the work. Um, but it was tied, and I'll just take things just, you know, um, um, you, know so you see that, you know, that element of knowledge. It was also tied to providing benefit um, because the, the, the basic jahanke ethic, we'll focus on the jahanke specifically, um, was actually to avoid uh, overt proselytizing. They did not um, aggressively try to convince people of, of Islam. Their goal, explicitly stated, was to pro provide a model. <laughs> um, and so instead, um, they would do things like, you know, cook large amounts of food on Friday, give them away as alms. And this produces a spiritual benefit for the one who gives the alms, but it also provides a material benefit for people who need, you know, healthy food <laughs> and who, who might be hungry that day. And if the hearts of the children of Adam naturally incline to those who provide benefit, then th their hearts are going to start to incline to people who provide this kind of benefit. One of the things that they often specialized in was actually using herbal healing technologies uh, as well. <laughs> um, so these teaching families were also often healing families. Um, so this is also another way um, you know, that, that, that they were seeking to, to provide benefit. Um, so the, the, this peaceful spread of Islam was related to the, uh, those other two dimensions, the knowledge dimension and the benefit dimension. Um, but that peaceful spread was predicated on, especially in the Jahanke case, but also with a bunch of other clerical groups in, in West Africa, and I'll mention a few of them. It was, it was based on an explicit avoidance of um, political authority. Scholars should not try to become kings. <laughs> because the, the basic role of the scholar in the, the West African, and one could say indeed the Islamic conception of, um, of the relationship between political and religious authority, the basic role of the scholar is to provide an independent, autonomous, ethical, and religious critique of those who exercise power. So they separate church and state to protect the independence of the church, not to protect the state. See, in the West, we protect, we separate church and state to protect the state from the church. They did it to, <laughs> to protect the church from the state, to, to keep it from being corrupted by the natural tendency in the human being to provide interpretations of Islamic law and Islamic understandings that would be favorable to political authorities so that they would ultimately you know, be currying favor with rulers or even trying to become rulers themselves. And in the cases that they, the few cases where they did try to become rulers themselves, the, the, the results were often you know, bad because who is gonna provide an independent critique of the, the, the state when the scholars have become the state? So you end up with bad religion and bad politics at the same time. And this was not just in the Jahangir tradition, and the, the, within the, the, the tradition of the Muradiya in Senegal, there's a famous, uh, there's a famous uh, story about the founder of the Muradiya, uh, Ahmed Obama Mbake. He is, he's invited by the most powerful ruler in his part of the world in the, in the late 19th century, the Dhamma Kajor, um, to come and serve as his chief judge. And Bamba, as a young man, you know, got to observe some of the inju fundamental injustices that, that could be you know, uh, tied to that. Actually, many of them had to do with um, justifications for enslaving people, and he dis distanced himself from this uh, because it was something that he found revolting. Um, in fact, there was once when a, um, a person came to try to give him a gift of a slave be because uh, of his piety, and he said, he said, you own him? 
And, he, and the man said yes. And he said, you know, he said in Wallaf, he said, Sokomo me yamumo nahmak mom nyobokoporum. Which means, if you own him, then you own me. Because he and I have the same master. <laughs> so Bamba was reticent to get involved in any kind of political game plan that might cause him to compromise his ethics. But he was very well known as a scholar, you know, had a huge reputation. So they kept insisting that making this offer for him to come and serve as the chief, the chief judge. Finally, he had had enough. He sent a letter uh, to the to, to the Dhamma. Now the Dhamma doesn't read Arabic to himself. You know, he has his court scribes, you know, read it to him. So. The, the scribe opens it, uh, the letter, and he starts to read it, and he says, you know, uh, King, I, I, I can't read this letter. He's like, you know, read the letter. What's wrong with you? He said, I, I can't read it. It's too offensive. I'm not going to I'm not gonna read the letter. He said, read the letter. He said, I'm not going to read it. it it's, it. it's hurtful to me. He said, read the letter. He said, he, he uses um, a maxim from uh, Muhammad ibn Maslama, one of the early scholars of Islam, that compares um, the, the cleric, who curries favor at the court of a king to a fly pe feeding on a pile of feces. And the king says, I don't know what you're so upset about. He's comparing you to a fly. He's calling me a pile of... <laughs> so the point was that by the, the appropriate relationship between the religious and temporal authority. This is this comes up in a, in a, um, the example from the Maliki juridical school. The founder of the, the Maliki school, uh, Malik ibn an Nas, uh, was uh, was once called by the caliph uh, at the time Harun al Rashid, who was uh, Al Rashid means the rightly guided, but he, he had a reputation for being not that all not all that rightly guided. Um, so he gets this invitation, he responds, he says that I would be ashamed to see, to have the angels of the right and the left um, recording the tracks of my steps on the way to the door of a sultan in a matter of the dunya. I would be ashamed to, 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 to be recorded walking to the court of a king in a worldly matter. So the, the, the basic idea is that the appropriate role is that political authorities should go visit scholars because that's beneficial. But when scholars go to the 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 it means that they want something in this world. And you should watch out. <laughs> you should watch out. There's a story that goes that goes with that. Is that one of the one of the pious has a dream where he sees one of the scholars burning in the fires of hell. And he sees one of the kings enjoying the gardens of paradise. And he, he, he is puzzled at this because it's contrary to the expectations of the people. And then a voice comes and says, um, the, the king is in the garden for being close to the scholars. And the scholar is in the fire for being close to kings. So this wasn't just um, um, a kind of thoughtless uh, disengagement from the political sphere. It was an ethical disengagement from the political sphere. It wasn't just um, in the cases like the, amongst the Jahanke or within the Muridia tradition where there's pronounced doctrines of nonviolence. It wasn't just a kind of unthinking nonviolence, like, oh, violence is bad. No, there's certain kinds of violence that, that you know, when people, you know, attack your, your family, you have a right to defend yourself. We all agree that, that states sometimes have to exercise violence in order, you know, to, 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 to protect people. It's not that kind of, of, you know, where you say, oh, you know, all violence is bad. No, but, but rather it, it was um, a, a, an ethical and spiritual value that was attached to... Um, never needlessly or carelessly spilling the blood of the children of Adam because nothing is more precious in the sight of God. There's, a, there's another scholar called uh, Cheno Bokar Salif Tal who says that the only jihad that we know is the jihad against the ego, the jihad in nafs. He says, as for the other one, he said it's, it's waged by people who loudly proclaim um, to, to love God 
but they love him badly because they destroy the most precious of his creation. So, instead of you know harming the children of Adam, provide benefits to the children of Adam. Um, instead of proclaiming your Muslim identity and standing on high, looking down at other folks, teach and learn knowledge. You know, you know, make yourself knowledgeable, make yourself beneficial. People will want what you have. <laughs> you won't have to tell them about it. <laughs> you won't have to persuade them. They'll be persuaded by your you know uh, example. You know because people don't really, you know, a certain amount of impact can be had by listening to what people say, but human beings are more practical than that. We watch what people do, you know, and when you see, you know, somebody, you know, who, who behaves in a way that's beautiful, you aspire towards that, and you want whatever they have that allows them to do it. Now, when you stand from a position of I'm a Muslim, I'm better. My identity is superior to yours. People can smell pride at distance and it's revolting. They will turn and run in the other direction. They don't want nothing of what you got. But when you cultivate humility, when you serve the weak and the poor and the needy, then they, they get interested. There's also another, you know, benefit in that, which is that they always started with the weak and the poor and the needy, you know, because the, and that was also why it was such a strong critique against the people who went running to kings, because, you know, the, 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 the Quran teaches that the followers of all of the prophets, upon them all peace, always had their impact amongst the poorest and the meekest members of society, because they had nothing to lose. Part, one of the biggest difficulties in getting people that, that um, in, in getting people interested in, in Islam if they're non-Muslim or getting people to make spiritual progress if they already are Muslim is getting people to give up attachment to the dunya, give up attachment to worldly things. Listen, poor folks have had the world make that decision for them. They've already given up one of the four principal enemies of man. You know, Ghazali identifies them. Um, and Ahmed Obama, the scholar I just mentioned earlier, he reduces them to a mnemonic device to help you understand. They're the nafs, the shaitan, the hawa, the dunya. Na shahadu. We bear witness. So the lower soul, the devil, the passions, and the world. And the world has already been, you know, taken away from poor people. They don't have nothing to lose, so it's easier to, to reach them. Start by feeding the poor. You know, do that rather than, you know, preach. Um, so knowledge, benefit, peace, um, scholarship, service, and a focus on the social rather than the political. And there are many, many other examples that I can get to. You know, far too many. You know, for 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 an interview this short. And you know, there's all kinds of you know, wonderful scholarship, you know, that emerges from, you know, from, from this tradition, you know, because of the trauma of slavery, many, as I said at the beginning, many of these West African scholars and West African Muslims end up being brought, you know, to, 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 to these very shores, and they're the first ones to implant Islam here. There's many elements to, to, to this story, and I discuss a number of them in a, in a book that, uh, called the, the, the Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge and History in West Africa. Um, so, you know, inshallah, this, this brief, you know, um, exchange uh, about um, some of the key elements of that Islamic West African tradition that are most applicable in our society here today um, will invite people to reflection, will invite people to reflect on Islamic ethical principles and models, but also on history. <laughs> um, and also specifically on West African history. Um, and the things that can be gained from it, and um, uh, inshallah, that will be a thing uh, that will provide uh, both knowledge and benefit, um, and and hopefully lead to increasing peace. <laughs>